Thanks, Craig. Uh, yes, yeah, so the Extreme Physics and Chemistry community is a group of individuals that has come together dedicated to understanding carbon at, as you might imagine, relatively extreme conditions, certainly compared to Earth's surface conditions. You've heard this phrase, this collection of words a number of times now, and you'll see it on the DCO uh, website. DCO is, conceives of itself as a global community on a quest to understand forms, quantity, movements, and origins of carbon in Earth. From the perspective of extreme physics and chemistry, the theme of what I'm going to describe to you today is focused chiefly on forms. Okay? And you'll see, as the other communities give you some overviews in, in the next few talks, um, different combinations of these forms, quantities, movements, and origins will, uh, will emerge. You've also seen a number of plots like the one on the right, which helps to organize our thinking about the way that carbon is transported through the various environments uh, near the Earth's surface anyway, and in the upper, down to depths of the upper mantle. And so here you can see uh, a, the, the organizing principle, which is a con convergent margin, and driven by plate tectonics, of course. And uh, in this kind of a plot, you'll see directions for carbon transport. In the extreme physics and chemistry community, we're more focused on what is the nature of carbon in each of these environments and in each of these squiggly arrows or straight arrows that you see. So uh, an alternative formulation of this kind of uh, plate tectonic um, way of organizing our thought would, would bring in the different forms that carbon might take. So you will see here, for example, that uh, carbon that's e being emitted from some sort of volcanic system might initiate in uh, a deeper environment as this form of carbon, carbonate and methane, before being emitted as carbon dioxide, which implies some sort of transformation. We have to ask how those forms come into being and how they transform from one to another. To make this work, uh, we have broken down the way that we approach the uh, problem of the extreme physics and chemistry of carbon uh, into the following decadal goals. We seek to look for new carbon-bearing materials. We want to characterize the structures of those materials. Uh, we want to develop and extend the uh, ways in which we can uh, investigate this material through experimental and theoretical approaches. And then we want to provide the input that's necessary for uh, developing uh, models of carbon movement in, from place to place in the outer part of the Earth. The guiding questions for all this uh, for the last decade, and hopefully as things go on, although these will evolve, uh, involve the physical and chemical properties of a carbon change. How does this work? What is the nature and the extent of carbon in Earth's core. This is an ongoing problem that consumes many hours of uh, wake, waking, uh, waking hours of people and sleepless nights indeed, and I don't know that this is a, there's an answer to this yet, uh, and it certainly is something that will continue to occupy people's minds in the, in, in the years to come. How do uh, extreme temperatures and pressures affect carbon's interactions with other elements? Carbon is allied in its transport and in its uh, existence with many other elements. It doesn't exist alone except in the circumstance of forming diamond or graphite. Uh, and, uh, and so how, the, how do temperatures and pressures affect the way it interacts with other elements in the interior? Uh, are there as yet undiscovered forms of carbon? We've learned that there are many undiscovered uh, types of carbon minerals near the Earth's surface, and some of those are being uh, uh, reported on as we speak. But uh, what's much harder is to understand these in Earth's interior. And finally, can we simulate, uh, how well can we simulate uh, conditions in the deep Earth and other planets? Okay, so what I want to do is kind of give you a, some, a broad thematic uh, overview of 
extreme physics and chemistry concerns, the topics that people have been working on. Obviously, I won't be able to discuss, discuss everything, but I want to just give you a sort of some highlights that uh, give you a sense of the uh, type of work that's being done and the way that we're pushing, uh, pushing forward. So to start this, um, I want to start with the carbon dioxide molecule. Um, everything that you've been seeing so far has focused on larger scales, spatial scales. And one of the key things that uh, makes the extreme physics and chemistry community unique is a focus on very small scales, on the microscopic scale, in fact, on the atomic and molecular scale. So here's a portrayal of the carbon dioxide molecule, familiar to many of you as a, this sort of dumbbell-shaped object with a carbon in the middle and two oxygens double-bonded, as you see here. Um, if you compress carbon dioxide, just as if you compress water, it will solidify to make an ice. These ices are very interesting, and they are formed of the molecules simply interacting with one another in fairly weak bonding to make crystal structures such as this, which you see here. This would be CO2-1 ice, not lice. <laughs> CO2-1 ice may not be something that is familiar to many of you. Actually, though, uh, you have come across it, especially if you uh, went to events like this in very early days. Carbon dioxide ice uh, was initially very early on used to generate fog effects in events, and I was hoping that we could do this here uh, on the stage <laughs> today, but uh, it proved unworkable. Um, and the uh, original idea was you just took a 55-gallon a, a gallon drum of hot water and dumped CO2 ice in it, and it's dense, this vapor form of CO2, so it makes this spectacular uh, fog on the stage. There are many better ways to do this now, and there are companies that are dedicated to uh, generating new and ever-improving uh, ways of creating fog and smoke at concerts and other events. Uh, I say this because, indeed, I really do wish we had this effect here. <laughs> but uh, here, Jimmy Page is um, enjoying the effects uh, some 40 years ago uh, on the stage. Well, if you take CO2-1 ice and compress it, you get a new form of ice, which it'd be two or three or even CO2 ice four, and what you see here are these same dumbbell shapes, uh, which are just in a different structure, okay? There are, every form, given a Roman numeral, has a different structure, and the, uh, the structures that you see are unique to a range of pressure and temperature. The interesting thing is that this dumbbell shape uh, of the CO2 is preserved, so the CO2 molecules continue to uh, exist as CO2 up until a very high pressure. And beyond that pressure, you get a complete rearrangement of the structure. And what you see here is carbons in gray and oxygens in red interlinked along these chains like this. Okay, this is a very different structure. It's much more like silicate minerals than uh, like the molecular ices of H2O and CO2. At the beginning of DCO, it was known that this was, uh, uh, this was happening in CO2 ices, but very little was understood about this fundamental structure uh, and what it would look like, okay? And in the early stages of DCO, uh, DCO scientists uh, working in EPC showed uh, with other groups at the same time that this was the structure. It had a very particular uh, type of structure that's like forms of quartz or silica uh, that uh, form in a, in a different structure. And just recently, it's now been demonstrated that this form of CO2 is actually immensely stable, is stable to pressures uh, that would exceed the core mantle boundary of Earth, and temperatures that are very high, it's not yet known how high uh, these are. So any uh, carbon dioxide compressed to the pressures of 30 to 40 GPA, gigapascals, uh, would be stable as this form of ice. Well, that's fine, but it turns out that CO2 is not actually the dominant form of carbon dioxide, uh, of, of carbon in the Earth's interior. What, certainly at the surface, we're familiar with carbon as uh, minerals uh, like cal calcite and aragonite. And so here you see the structure of calcite, okay? And uh, it is dominated by calcium ion, bonded with carbonate ions like this to form a salt 
That's calcium carbonate. And you can see the arrangement of these structures here throughout. And this carbonate is, persists and repeats in a regular pattern which gives calcite the external form that you see here. Another way of stacking these things together would be a way to produce aragonite. These are what you see for calcium carbonate near, near the Earth's surface. And uh, other carbonate minerals of iron and magnesium do have a similar sort of arrangement of cations, in this case calcium or magnesium and iron, with, with the carbonate. Just as with CO2, it turns out, the carbonate minerals show this interesting rearrangement of their structure so that they become extended or polymerized or connected between the carbons and the oxygens throughout a structure. So Eglantin Boulard and others showed early in the DCO's history and then continued uh, to demonstrate new ways that this could be shown uh, as, as time went on, uh, that the form of a magnesium and iron carbonate has carbon and oxygen in which the, the connections are seen here to be much more extensive than they are in this case here. Initially, the work showed this using uh, the traditional form that mineral physics people use, which is X-ray diffraction. But this is a spectroscopic determination. of the, This is infrared spectroscopy here. We don't need to look at the details. It's just that there are many lines of evidence that now uh, uh, demonstrate that this structural uh, reformation of carbonate into new forms at high pressure is real. It happens, uh, it, we now can measure their structures, which we weren't able to do before, and we can start to understand things about how these minerals will interact with other materials. <clears throat> In fact, the, the kind of zoo of mineral types uh, is pretty profound. Marco Merlini and team, uh, Alex Gontroff, Sergei Lobanov, and so on, have shown us that there, these extended forms of carbonate minerals uh, are just all over the place. They have many different possible structures. When you take a carbonate mineral and subduct it, as Suki Dorfman was talking about in her lightning talk just moments ago, uh, the ways in which that carbon will react on its own and, and rearrange with the oxygen and the cations are uh, essentially manifold. Okay? And so this has a really important implications because when we go back to this diagram, what you see is that the forms of carbon as they're moving through this pathway here um, are often thought to be sort of affected very strongly by this need, by this, this, this breaking of the bonds between carbon and oxygen and the reduction in the oxygen, uh, cap uh, oxygen partial pressures in the deep earth. In these new forms, it is possible that carbonate can be uh, carried to great depth uh, much more effectively and could be stable at greater depth than we previously realized when we considered only the, high, the low pressure forms of carbon and carbonate particularly uh, that break down in this environment in, in here. Okay, so that's a, an overview of the kind of under, the, the approach that people have taken to understanding minerals uh, in, in the extreme physics and chemistry group. Um, another topic that has occupied uh, much time and has been a major success for the extreme physics and chemistry group and you know in allied with other communities is the understanding of how carbon works when it's dissolved in water and this has led to profoundly new insights into carbon in the deep earth so as material is subducted along the paths that i've just described to you in the in the previous schematic diagram the pressure on this axis and temperature on this axis increase in the, in, in a, depending on the system, it can be anywhere in these gray regions in here. Ding Pan and colleagues have uh, asked the simple question, well, what is the nature of carbon when it interacts with water in its oxidized form of CO2 uh, at these high pressures? And following on from experimental work by Evan Abramson at low temperatures, what Ding Pan has done uh, with his student is to show that if by ab initio molecular simulation, dynamic simulations, uh, as you increase the amount of carbon dioxide in a fluid phase that starts off as pure water, that has no carbon dioxide in it, and you add carbon dioxide to, until you get to a maximum of one, um, what you see is that the form of carbon is actually something very different than we expect. Most 
up until you know, just several years ago, all scientists would have told you that if you mix those two molecules together at high pressures and temperatures, those two molecules will remain carbon dioxide and H2O mixed together. It's not true. They don't. They are, in fact, form different types of structures in the solution. Carbonate ion, H2CO3 acid, which is carbonic acid, is never present near the Earth's surface, but it appears to be dominant, especially at low CO2 concentrations, at the high pressures that we see of subduction zones. This is a profoundly important result that will have important implications for not just Earth sciences, but chemistry in general. This work of the type that I've described to you by Ding Pan and colleagues has under, basically underlies another major achievement of the, of the DCO, and that is the development of the Deep Earth Water Model, uh, which is built on the kinds of simulations that uh, Ding Pan does, and has allowed us to extend the approaches for understanding water in things like hot springs or groundwater systems down to the, into the deep earth environments where uh, water and carbon interact and transport a significant amount of material. And so this is how, bef before DCO started, this is what we, we could model. Okay, this is pressure, this is temperature. Sorry, it's off the axis there. Uh, and this, we're, things were limited to temperatures out to about 1,000 degrees C, but only as high as five kilobars, which is you know, halfway down in the Earth's crust. Now we can uh, understand aqueous geochemistry at a much higher range of pressures and temperatures. And this is entirely attributable to science that was done under the auspices of the DCO. And so an example of the kind of thing that you can do here is you can compare experiments on the solubility of calcium carbonate as aragonite at very high pressures. And uh, this is at a low temperature here. And, take, and these are the experimental measurements, and the theoretical prediction independent of the experiments is shown in the red line here. And it's not just that you can get the total amount of stuff dissolved correct. You can also figure out what the different uh, species present in the aqueous phase might be. This has also opened up new avenues for understanding organic chemistry at extreme environments. It doesn't have to be in water, but this is just an example of the kind that people in uh, Arizona State are doing uh, with Everett Schock as the lead and a number of students of his, including Megan Guild. Previously, we thought really just about the main molecular species of CH4, methane, and carbon dioxide, which would be stable as a function of oxygen content in the system. But if you look at subduction zones, again, in the study that they've done here, pressures and temperatures changing along the black line, you find that there is a massive number of uh, organic complexes that are present in the system. This, I don't expect anyone to even like, but let alone understand this diagram here. <laughs> I'm not sure that Megan and Everett did, but being that they're in, at Arizona State and that um, we're, that's west of us here, uh, I'm calling this the Spaghetti Western diagram. <laughs> and all it shows is the evolution of the different organic species along this path here, the concentration and temperature increasing along with pressure here. We've talked about minerals, we've talked about a fluid phase, which you can imagine is water containing a lot of dissolved constituents. Of course, another form of materials in the deep earth are molten magmas. Carbon is no exception to this, and it finds its way into all molten systems. And uh, an example of the kind of thing that tends, ends up mattering a lot is how much carbon gets stripped from a, me a melting, downgoing slab uh, in a system like this. And if according to Megan Duncan and um, Raj Dasgupta, if the carbon is present in reduced form as graphite initially, uh, very little of the carbon is stripped by the melt that happens here and much is carried deep. And they postulate that this is a very important for the evolution of oxygen in the Earth, their early Earth history. Uh, that raises the topic, of course, that much of the kind of depictions that we're seeing here uh, are based on the present day Earth. But early Earth history was very different. Uh, there, uh, the plate tectonic regime that we're in now is really maybe at, uh, at, is at least half of the Earth history, maybe more, it's a subject of debate. Very early in Earth history, there was a time when much of the outer part of the Earth was molten, experiencing a magma ocean. And this is a time when a lot of the carbon, a lot of the other volatiles were segregated from the interior. A lot of the irons dropped out to form the core. Much of Earth's structure was formed uh, 
in the magma ocean stage, so arguably one of the most important stages in the history of the, uh, of the planet. And I don't know that I can start this movie, but if you could in the back uh, start the movie for me. This is a depiction of a molten bulk silicate earth composition and uh, the, uh, with 5 weight percent CO2 dissolved in it. It's a molecular dynamic simulation done at 188 GPA and 4,000 Kelvin. The total time that you're going to see here is uh, 12 picoseconds, so very short time. But the carbon is the blue. All cations are removed except for silicon and oxygen, which are the yellow and the red, respectively. And if you watch the blue carbons, what you're finding, especially right there, is carbon-carbon interaction. Carbon is bonding to carbon here. Carbon uh, is also present in three-fold and four-fold coordination at various times. And, this, and it interacts with uh, oxygen and with silicon through oxygen bonds as well. This is how a, a molten silicate would interact, would, would contain carbon uh, in the deep earth at core mantle boundary types of conditions. I'll just close by saying that this pressure, to those of you who are aficionados, is actually higher than the core mantle boundary uh, pressure. And what this tells us is that an, an avenue for research that's opening up based on DCO-style research for the last 10 years and for the future DCO will involve looking at the molten conditions in super-Earths that extend well beyond, that have pressures that extend well beyond the core mantle boundary kind of pressure that would characterize uh, most of the studies that you would see uh, uh, like this. So thank you for your attention. I hope I've convinced you that the EPC scientists have made uh, impressive progress on all fronts uh, on, in studying the forms of carbon in the deep earth and other planets.